Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Long Hill Chapel. My name is Michael Hadi. I am the lead pastor here, and I'm so glad that you are here with us today on this beautiful day uh, where we will uh, just celebrate kicking off fall together. There's always plenty of food, so if you didn't bring food, uh, one of the things, we've had a lot of challenges. The church has a lot of challenges sometimes. We have seasons we go through. One thing we have never had any issues with is running out of food at Long Hill Chapel. We've never run out of food yet. Uh, so we would love for you, uh, whether you came with something or not, to uh, please join us afterwards. Uh, also, just a word about the Team Jersey thing. This is really a chance to see how unified we are or are not as a church. Because I saw, you know, we've got some Giants jerseys, I saw some Eagles jerseys. Uh, so we're going to see how, how deep the bonds of unity really go. Uh, I am wearing a New York Yankees jersey. Yes, I'm aware they do not play football. I'm aware that Aaron Judge is not a football player. Uh, as some of you, your season is beginning. Our season is starting to come to an end, so just to mourn with me a little bit uh, as, we, uh, as we get to the end of the baseball season. But we're so glad that you're here, and uh, we are continuing our series for the second week, and this is a very positively titled series called You Can't. I don't know if in your work life or maybe, you know, when you're, you're building something at home or you decide you're going to take on a project in your house or, or just something like that that's given to you where you think you have all the instructions and all the answers and you get into the middle of it and you discover that you don't know everything that you got into. You start out to do a thing, maybe you're at work and your boss is like, hey, go do this thing, and you're like, I can totally do that thing, and you get into the middle of it, you're like, I only have about half of the information that I need. You know, and it would have changed how you approached it had you known what you were getting into. And some of you have done that. You've, you've gotten into home remodeling. You watched a couple of YouTube videos, and you're like, I can totally do this. And then you rip the thing apart, and you discover, you know, it's a lot more complicated than you thought. Or maybe you do that with your car. Uh, there's a whole bunch of ways we do that where if we had known the whole picture of what we were getting ourselves into, it probably would have changed how we did it or sometimes even if we had done it at all. And so that's really what we're talking about today in the second week of You Can't, which is really this idea that there's many things we can do, there's many things Jesus tells us to do, but there's a few things uh, that he talks about where you can't and we can't do it. But when we embrace those and understand how they impact us as we live our lives as followers of Jesus and as people in the world, uh, it literally changes everything. So before we get started today, uh, would you pray with me? God, we come in on this beautiful fall early day, and some of us are just at the, you know, we're at the top of the world. We feel like everything is going right in our lives. Uh, some of us, uh, we barely made it here today. Some of us just tuned in online, and it's, it's, we're not sure whether we should be here or not. And so we come uh, with all sorts of things in our hearts, high points, low points, joys, and struggles, and we pray more than anything else that in the way that only you can, you would meet us in the midst of all of those places with yourself, with your presence, where if we don't even remember anything else that happened today, we would know that we have encountered you, that it would change us, it would encourage us, it would put us on the path to continue to walk forward. Give us strength for the journey, we pray. And as we look into your word, I just ask that you would open our minds, open our hearts, open our ears, and uh, would we not just be hearers, but would we be a church and would we be a people who are doers? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So today, we are reading a passage that Jesus was talking to his disciples. It's in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16. And it is uh, one of these very positive passages of Scripture that Jesus, as we talked about a little bit last week, very often would say confusing things or sometimes disorienting things uh, to the people who followed him around. We like to think of Jesus as like, you know, this positive teacher who always has these very concise things that he says. We're like, whoa, that changes everything for us. And he does that. But sometimes uh, he communicates in this other way as well. And what he's beginning to do, just to set up the context of what we're going to talk about today, is he's beginning to talk about the fact uh, that he's going to die. He's going to be crucified. He's, the end of this story is not the end of the story that maybe they thought that it was. And so he just lays out the plot for them. He's like, this is what's going to happen. This is what you can expect. And I think sometimes if you're a Christian, uh, we... We don't like the idea that Jesus had to die. We're thankful he did because he died for our sins. He gave us hope that begins now and extends through eternity. But we also kind of like the idea that Jesus died so that we don't have to. We like the idea that Jesus died so that we don't have to. And some, some of us have even heard that phrase. And there's truth to that. There's something that Jesus did that we cannot do, we could not do for ourselves. There's no way we could hope to do it for ourselves. 
But sometimes we forget the fact that when Jesus calls us onto the path of following him, it's not in the direction that we think that it is. And that was true for the people who were following him and were hearing this exact story at the same time. And that's where we find the thing that we can't do today. And so we're going to read from Matthew chapter 16, beginning at verse 13. Uh, and running through verse 28. So if you have your Bibles, I'd encourage you to follow along. There is a Bible right on the app. So if you've downloaded the app, you can totally just open that up. You can get right there. And there's obviously an analog Bible in the pew rack in front of you. Uh, But the words will also be on the screen behind me. So let's read together. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? And Son of Man is shorthand for who do people say that I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist... Others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And so Jesus had showed up, and he'd done these things, and he had begun to perform miracles, and nobody in that time had seen this sort of thing in quite some time. So there was all this speculation about who is this person? Who is Jesus? Who is, what does he represent? Is he like the return of one of the prophets? Is he a new version of that? What is he? But what about you, he asked. Who do you say that I am? Simon Peter, who was one of his disciples, answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Right answer. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter. And so this is one of these times where someone gets a new name in the Bible. They get a new identity. Names in that culture were very much tied, uh, even more than they are in our culture, to a sense of who you were as a person. You are Peter, which literally means rock, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. So this is kind of like the big payoff moment. This is like one of those gold star moments for this disciple named Peter, who if you followed his story at all, maybe you've heard some of the other stories about him uh, here at Long Hill Chapel as we've journeyed through the scriptures and through the Bible together. You know, Peter was this impulsive guy. He was a fisherman. He was a self-made man. Uh, He kind of got the clue or picked up the hint or, you know, got to the right decision a little later sometimes than a lot of folks. But this is one of those places where he just knocks it out of the park. It's just like, you know, when your kid is up front and it's like the recital or it's the, it's the, you know, it's the the school play, or it's, it's the game that they're playing, and then they just do everything right. That was Peter's moment. He, he names this reality that seems for some of us like Jesus is the Son of God, he's the Messiah. It seems like such an easy thing for us to understand, some of us, but for them and for that group of people, it was a very difficult thing for them to understand. But we're not done with the passage yet, and that's the challenge with this thing that we can or can't do. Because Jesus' message does not stop when we finally connect the dots of who he is. You know, many of us think, you know, if we just get across the line of faith, that's that's the goal line. That's an important line. We need to do that. We need to put our faith and our trust and our hope in Jesus and, and just continue on that journey. It's important that we start there, but we can't stop there. And so what's about to happen is Jesus gets us to this point. He gets Peter to this point. But then he makes another turn, a second turn. And it's a really dramatic turn. And it's a turn that a lot of people, then and now, don't make with him because it's a difficult turn. And some of us have not made this turn. Some of us have a hard time staying through this turn as Jesus makes it. So the passage continues. It's not over. A lot of times when you hear what I just read, it is kind of, that's like the segment, and we say, yay, Peter made the right decision. He identified who Jesus is, and Jesus said, you're going to be the one on whom I build everything else that comes after. I'm going to build the church. You know, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. There's nothing that will stop the work of the kingdom of God, nothing that will overcome it. And then we pray, and then we go to lunch. But the passage isn't over. Hear what Jesus says next. This is verse 21 of Matthew chapter 16. From that time on, so it's almost as if, you know, Peter has made this decision. He's made this realization. 
But from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law. Those were the religious authorities at the time. And he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. So this is like a major plot twist. You know, the credits are rolling. It's like, you're the son of God, and I'm going to build this thing that's going to last afterwards on you, Peter. And the gates of hell won't prevail against it. Nothing will stop it. There's no circumstance. There's no force. There's no power. There's nothing that can stop this from happening. But then Jesus makes this turn, and it doesn't seem like a victorious turn. And so he says this, and then verse 22, it says this, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him which means, you know, just, just, it's the thing you do with your kids when they're really out of line. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. So it's this incredibly interesting response. You know, I don't know if you've, you have one of those friends who sometimes they say something kind of negative about themselves. They're like, you know, I am not very smart. You know, I always get this stuff wrong. And so it's kind of like you almost like playfully say, no, that's not true. That's not true about you. You're not like that. Come on. It seems like that's part of what Peter is doing here. But I think that Jesus' response in the next verse tells us that this isn't just like that playful, you know, come on, it's not going to be like that. Listen to what Peter says. Remember what Jesus, or listen to what Jesus says. Remember what Jesus has just said about Peter. He said, you are Peter. You are a rock. There's nothing that can stop what I'm going to build on your life and on your example. I'm going to build a church, and the gates of hell are never going to prevail against it. So he's given this incredibly positive affirmation to Peter. But listen to what he says here in verse 23. Then Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. And you do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. So, like in one breath, Jesus confirms, affirms Peter's identity and his mission that upon this rock, upon this leadership, upon this example, I'm going to build something that lasts, that nothing will oppose. But in the next breath, he's calling him Satan. That's a, that's a little strong. You probably haven't called someone that recently and a stumbling block. Now, here's the thing. I'm sure that Peter loved Jesus, and Peter didn't want him to die. You know, this is his teacher. This is the one that he's followed for all of these years. But I also think it's more than just that. When Peter says, this is never going to happen to you. It seems like in that moment inside, Peter needed Jesus to do this Messiah thing that he had identified, this one who was going to save the world, this one who was going to put everything right, this one who was going to make everything make sense, this one who was going to bring back the good times. He needed him to do that in a certain way. It's like he had this picture of how it was all supposed to go. It's like he had this idea of the role that Jesus was going to play. Now, if we're really honest with ourselves, we do this all the time with people in our lives. We, people come into our lives, and it's, maybe it's a relationship that starts, or it's a friendship, or maybe you fall in love with someone, or you're, you, know, you have some kids, and they start to grow up. We have this picture of how we think it's going to go. And maybe we never say it. We never say, you know, I, I, I think it's going to go like this. But we have this picture that's built in our minds of the kinds of things that are going to happen, the direction that that relationship is going to go, where it's going to take us. But we also do that exact same thing when it comes to Jesus. We have this picture, maybe when we come across the line of faith, maybe, you know, you've been walking with God for a while, and you, you just, you have this idea of how you think the world is supposed to turn out, how it's supposed to go. And then when it doesn't go that way, it's this incredibly challenging moment. It's almost a crisis at times for us. And we find ourselves responding in kind of the same way that Peter responds. We say, God, you're not supposed to do it like this. 
You know, I, I, you're, you're, you're God. I'm following you with my life. You know, I prayed a prayer. You know, you are my Lord and Savior, but you're not supposed to go this way. You're not supposed to lead me in this direction. The way things are playing out in the world around me, this isn't the way that it's supposed to happen. And so Peter's response, and ours, frankly, demonstrate an important distinction. It is possible for us to know who Jesus is, but to not understand how his mission works. It's possible for us to know who Jesus is, but to fail to grasp, to fail to understand, to connect the dots of exactly how this all works itself out. And so there's that first turn. It's like that first half of the instructions that you figure out to that thing that you're supposed to do. And then you get in the middle and you realize that there's this whole other piece to the thing that you, you didn't really anticipate, that you didn't understand. You know, it's kind of like there's this first turn when we turn to Jesus, but then as we begin to follow Jesus, there's another turn to understanding and accepting how in the world it is that he works and to follow him in that. You know, I've lived in New Jersey for uh, 24 years and change at this point. And, you know, when I moved to New Jersey, I was lost. This was before some of you are like, man, Michael, you are so old. Uh, this was before GPS. This was before you like had it on your phone or even in your car. And so, you, you MapQuest. Does anyone remember MapQuest? Anyone? Okay, that's all the old people, older people in the room. Some of you are like, "What is that?" Um, some of you who are younger, let me just explain what you used to have to do. It was better than like a paper map, but you'd have to go on the internet. You'd have to like dial up your internet connection, and you could plot out a set of directions from point A to point B, and then you'd have to print them out. And you'd have to take them in your car with you. And some of you who are like my age and up, you're, you're totally following me. And you'd have to follow those directions. You know, I came to New Jersey, and that was an option, but I was lost constantly. Uh, but I've been here a while now, so I've mostly figured out how to navigate around this crazy state of New Jersey. Some of you are new here to the state. I'm so sorry in advance. Uh, nothing we do makes sense. Sometimes the jug handle's over here. Sometimes it's past the traffic light. Sometimes it's before the traffic light. Sometimes it's just on the left, in the middle of the median. And it's like, what, what rhyme or reason is it to this thing? But one of the things we love here in New Jersey are traffic circles. Like, I, they have them, I guess, in London, in Europe. But we have traffic circles here in New Jersey. And there's a few places in New Jersey where there's, like, one traffic circle followed by another traffic circle. If you've ever, like, driven down near the Flemington area, it's a good time. I've lived here for a long time. I managed to get myself completely, like, like upside down lost in these traffic circles following the GPS. So that's who you're dealing with, just so we're, we're clear about that. Because what there is, is there's like the first turn you make when you're like, I am in the traffic circle, I am committed, I've not gotten killed by a tractor trailer that's coming and whipping around the curve. But then there's a second turn that you have to make at some point, or else you just go around the circle endlessly, which seems like a lot of fun in some ways, but if you're ever going to get anywhere, you have to make a second turn. And that's what this is. This is the second turn. This isn't the one where, you know, we've made the commitment and we're in the circle. This is the second turn to how does this go next? And I think the thing that's challenging for us, for all of us, whether you're new at faith or whether you've been at this for longer than I've been alive, is that when Jesus makes that second turn, very often it's not the second turn we expect him to make. We're like, we're going to go here and he's going to go there, you know, and this is going to happen and very often, that's not what happens. You know, there's this famous verse in the Old Testament. It's in the book of Jeremiah. It's like on bumper stickers and bookmarks and keychains and things like that. It says this, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. We love that verse. But really the way, if we're truly honest with ourselves, if we're truly transparent, that we like to envision it is we have plans that God is going to bless. We have a vision for the world that God is going to carry out. So we end up having plans for God. And we're really asking, we're hoping, we're looking, we're wanting, we're like, God, bless the thing that I think ought to happen. 
You know, many of us, we have some idea of who God is, and it's, it's a good idea. It's not inaccurate. But then there's this way that he works. And whether we realize it or not, it's not the way we would work if we were God. Sometimes don't you just wish you could be God for like a day? You know, I'd have a list of things that I would take care of in that day. But it's not how God works. And here's where this gets complicated for us. If we don't make that second turn, we either miss God or unwittingly we actually oppose the way of God. I'll come back to that second statement in just a minute. So why do we need to do this? On September 15th, 2024, why do we need to do this? We need to do this for two reasons. One, if we don't, we will misunderstand how Jesus is working in the world, and when he doesn't work the way we expect him to work, we will become very disillusioned and confused. So when we're expecting him to get off this exit of the circle and he goes up here instead and he does this, we will become very disillusioned. We'll become very confused. And what happens in that moment more often than not is we end up trying to staple Jesus onto whatever other thing in the world says, you know that thing that you wish was different, that I, you know, you wish someone would go fix and make right and make clear and make understandable. We will end up trying to staple Jesus to that thing or that person or that agenda or whatever it is and Jesus ends up attached to all sorts of things that he never attached himself to here's another part to it the biggest struggle people have who are not Christians with Christians listen to me folks eyes up here listen to me the biggest struggle The people who are not Christians have with Christians is not what we believe. It's not what we believe. I mean, they have have a lot of questions about that. But that's not their biggest struggle. And there are statistics and surveys that back this up. It is how Christians work that out in the world. It is how they act. It's how we act. It's how we respond. It's especially how we respond when things don't go the way that we think they ought to go. And that is where people who are not Jesus followers have the biggest challenge with Jesus followers. It's just how they respond to things. And I think the past few years, like nothing else in our history, as a people in this country, have exposed how much of a gap there is sometimes between what Jesus is up to and what we wish Jesus was up to. So Jesus doesn't do the things the way we think he ought to do, and so we go looking somewhere else, and we respond in all sorts of crazy ways, and if we don't understand what he's doing and how he's at work, we end up being a very poor witness to the world around us. But if we do understand, it is the thing that literally changes everything. This is the key to that changing. If we, we as the people of God, we're going to understand the call of God and the mission of God, it will be because we do it in the way that God does it. Not just doing God things our own way. You know, I think with a series like this, there's a couple of you, you know, you've been in faith longer than I've been alive, maybe. And you're like, oh boy, here comes another softball message from the Gospels. When are we going to talk about the minor prophets? When are we going to talk about the writing style of the Apostle Paul and the epistles and the original language? And That's all good stuff. When are we going to get to the meat? Friends, this is the meat of the gospel. This is the simple, very hard thing. This is the thing that is easy for us to miss, even if we know a lot about Jesus. This is the thing that when Jesus turns, we need to make sure that we're turning with him. I think it's the way he responds, the words he uses to Peter, the one he's just affirmed, the one he's just commissioned, are so key for us. He calls him literally Satan. He says, get behind me, Satan. The word Satan, you know, it means the devil, like cosmic, eternal evil. But in literal terms, it means the one 
who opposes. The one who opposes. He calls Peter, the one who just described as this foundation, this thing on which something can be built. Instead, he describes him as a stumbling block. The one where the mission of God is going, and then there's something that just trips it up. Doesn't stop it, but it trips it up. And if Peter, the one who was with him, the one who followed him, the one who struggled, the one who came to believe, the one on which this institution, this thing that we're part of, the church, was built, if this can happen to him, it can happen to us. Sometimes our good intentions for God trip things up. So how do we make that second turn? We've made the first turn, we're in the circle, we didn't get hit. We made the commitment, we accelerated in, we're ready to go. We made that decision for Jesus. How do we make that second turn into the direction that he's going? Let's finish the passage together, verse 24. This, by the way, is not something that any of us really want to hear, but let's listen to it anyway. Didn't Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, But whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anybody give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and he will reward each person according to what they have done. And truly, I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. There's some words in here that are not our favorite words to hear. There's this word deny. And I don't think any of us in this room really like to deny ourselves things. We, we don't like that. That's not, that's not like a positive thing. Sometimes you go on a diet and you deny yourself things. Or, you know, maybe you observe the season of Lent when it comes around and you give something up for Lent. That's really, that, that's, that's, that idea is kind of based in this passage. You know, but it's bigger than fasting. It's bigger than Lent. It's bigger than skipping dessert. And by the way, please do not do this at the picnic. Today, I'm talking about one thing, and then you're going to go do something completely the opposite of the thing that I'm talking about. Please don't do it at the picnic, because we always have way too much food. So go indulge yourself over there, but then when it comes to following Jesus, maybe we need to do something else. So we, we don't really like this very much, but it's this idea that I have a picture of how I want things to happen, what I want my life to look like, how I want it to work out, the things I want to achieve, the things I want to accomplish, the vision that I have for the future. These are all good things, and this is why it's hard when we come to this kind of a passage that says, you know, all those good things cannot rule you. They're good things. God has given you good things. He's given you a vision. And maybe it's not all great, but there's a lot of good in it. But this is not something that we do easily. It's when we say, I have this way, but there's this way that Jesus is calling me to live. You know, I I have the exit I'd like to get off of on the circle. It looks great. It's easy. It's wide. It's right there. But there's this other one up here that Jesus is calling me in the direction of. It's giving up our own interests, our own way of doing things. And we live in a culture, especially around here, where this is just not something that anybody wants to do. This is not something any of us want to do at all. And what is incredibly fascinating is this word, deny, is found in two places in the New Testament. Two places. They're both in the Gospels. This is one of them. And the other one is around the Easter story, around the story when Jesus is crucified, when, when the same person, Peter, denies Jesus three times. He says, I, I, I don't even know who this person is. And I think it's interesting for us, and it's important for us, and it's a warning for us, because it tells us that if we don't do the first, if we don't take up our cross and deny ourselves and follow Jesus, we will end up doing the second. We don't do the first. We'll end, up, we'll end up at some point, the way of Jesus will go in a direction that we no longer want to go, and we end up falling off the path. So how do we do this? 
Jesus tells us, he says, take up your cross. And the cross was something at that point which represented, uh, I think, simply death. It represented something that you had to carry. And in order to carry it, you had to put some other things down. But I also think there's another subtlety we have to understand here. You know, there's this, past, this person here that says, then we will, he will reward, Jesus, God will reward each person according to what they have done. And this is one of those places where the English language falls a little bit short of exactly what he said. Because what it kind of means, it means that God will reward us for the way that we did the things in our life. Not just what we did, but how and by what means we did it. And here's where this is ironic, and it's really not easy for us to get with the way we've been wired, is that when we do this, this is the only time and this is the only place and this is the only way that we find life that is truly life. Some of you have seen a glimpse of this in your lives. You know, you've, you've given up your own interest for some interest that's greater than you. You know, some of you, you've, you've committed to, to parenting children or raising children, and you know that there's sacrifice all along that journey, and there's hardship, and some of you are going through that right now. But there's also the joy of something that's greater than yourself. You know, some of you have, you've served in sacrificial ways. You serve the people, the poor, the homeless. You've gone on missions trips. You've given up of yourself to people and for something that does not pay you back in the way that you have given. And you touch this just a little bit when you do that because you're aware of the fact that when you deny, you know, I could go on vacation, I could spend this money elsewhere, I could take this time and do something for me. When you do that, there's this reward that you experience in the moment and I believe also in the hereafter. You're storing up treasure in heaven, God says. And you touch on this, and you're aware that my life is now bigger than anything that I had a part of. But this is not something that we do naturally, and it's why we need to make that second turn over and over and over and over again. But when we do it, and when we keep doing it, we find life that is truly life. And if we don't, we actually lose life what makes us human. We lose our souls. So we have a choice. Many of us have made the first turn to saving faith. And if you haven't, that's where you begin. It's saying, Jesus, I don't have all the answers. I don't understand all of this, but I confess that you are my Savior, my Lord. I, I, I know that you died for my sins. And I want to follow you with the rest of my life. But then following and doing it and doing it again is the second turn that we need to make. And it's the only way our lives end up mattering to others and for eternity in this world. It's the only way we end up in the right places and at the right times is when someone else, when God is directing our path. And so as we close today and before we go eat way too much food. I have a few questions for us to just ponder. Maybe one of these is where you are today. The first one is this. Where has your expectation of Jesus gotten in the way of truly following him? You expected it to look like this. And it doesn't. And I believe it's possible for us to cry out to God in those moments, say, God, I thought the path was going to look like this, but it, it doesn't. Where are you? Where is it that I expected something different than what you were doing? Where's your expectation of Jesus got in the way of truly following him? Where in your life, second question, do you know who Jesus is? You, you have this awareness of who he is, but you, you're just misunderstanding how his mission works. It is possible to walk with Jesus a long time and to continually misunderstand how he does things, especially when the world around us starts to seem like it goes in a different direction than what we thought God was up to doing. And in that moment, 
Have you asked God to show you his way? Have you asked him, God, this is not what I expected. Show me your way. This is not how I expected things to happen. This is not how I expected my life to be. This is not how I expected my circumstances to play out. Where are you at work in this moment where I'm feeling the tension and the disconnect between who you are and what's going on? And finally, what is the cross asking from you today? What is this way of dying to ourselves, denying ourselves, picking up our cross and following Jesus. What's that asking from you today? And friends, every single one of you who is in this room who is watching online, it is asking something of each of us. And again, that is a question to take before the Lord. It's an invitation to listen and move with his leading. Even if it's taking you somewhere you probably wouldn't naturally go, that you'd even not prefer to go or keep going. But it's a place he will go with you. And it's a place where life will be truly life. Would you pray with me? Jesus, uh, another passage from your word that uh, some of us have heard parts of but which challenges each one of us. There's nobody who has checked this box because it's a turn you are constantly calling us to make. I ask for my friends here as we, we continue to walk on this counterintuitive way that doesn't seem like anything else the world around us asks of us. It's not the way that was reinforced over and over for us to live. You'd show us what you're asking of us today, where you're asking us to make that second turn. And then, as we take that step, as we make that turn, would you be with us? Would you empower us? Would you give us wisdom and strength and courage and clarity where we need it? Because it's a difficult path, but it's the path you're on. You've promised to be with us, to never leave us for, or forsake us. And it's a place where there is life that is truly life. I pray for each of us as we ponder, as your spirit speaks to us. I thank you for our time together, and I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.